good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today's uh, Skulk lecture. Today we have a very, very exciting topic, spatial transatomic correlating electron microscopy to study the brain aging. That's a mouthful. We have a very nice speaker, uh, Gos uh, Oskin uh, Goskun. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, thanks. Uh, from the LMU Clinic on the Institute for Stroke and Dementia Research here in Munich. Um, but before we get to that exciting lecture, we have a couple of announcements. Um, next lecture is from Stein Arts uh, and from Leuven. We are still waiting for a title, but it's also going to be a very exciting one next October. So please do check in, check in and sign up for that one. And um, next, we also have an event in Bonn, the single cell omics in, in clinical applications. Super exciting with a bunch of uh, very, very interesting speakers with very exciting topics. So please do check out that in the website and uh, we look forward to that meeting. Finally, uh, please make sure that if you have a, um, the presentation is gonna be 30 minutes. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or uh, put in the chat your question. And I'm gonna make sure that uh, it gets, uh, the question gets asked. And um, yeah, and I think we, we are ready to go. Okay, go all of you. All right, is it working? Yes, it is. Awesome. So I thank you very much. I'm Özgün Gökçe. I finished my postdoc in Stanford and moved to Germany in 2016. And my group started in 2017. So this is summary of the, what uh, my students, my group, and our is a team, what we have done. And I wanted to combine it in a way why we, the philosophy of the talk, I generally try to because we develop and rely on technology single cell and transcriptomic technology but this is uh, in a hypothesis driven way we approach that and i wanted to first start with actually the people who done the work uh, i have a wonderful team and the the pictures in here the key people contribute to the work that i will be presenting and we have a bunch of PhD technician and uh, postdoctoral positions, please uh, contact us and drop us on job archive. Uh, most of all of this work in a close collaboration with a partnership with uh, Mikhail Simons, uh, we work, our labs work in a really collaborative manner. Uh, they are, uh, my students and their students build up a team and this being transformative how uh, two different labs combined together and became something much bigger. Martina Sheffer, uh, she is an amazing electron microscopist and she, uh, the last part, she, she is, her contribution is dramatic. Rudolf Martini's first book and Martin Guerra are uh, mass spectrometry, multi-imaging collaborations. And I like to thank all our funders. So what we study, we study aging why still instead of a uh, working on a disease i thought working on a risk factor that cut through all the diseases makes sense and specifically for dementias that my focus is uh aging has a quite interest different uh, slope if you see here uh all the diseases from car heart cardiac arrest uh, stroke, diabetes, they go linearly higher as we age. Aging goes quite flat. At around 65, it goes, changes the slope. And what happens there, kind of I started to thought, if we can flatten the curve here, the difference would be huge and we would actually improve uh, societal, uh, we will improve the, our uh, quality of life dramatically if we can understand what is happening around that point. And what could be, and there is this really cool study from uh, Beth Helm in Nature, and they look hundreds of thousands of MRI to longitudinal. What they saw is the ventricular, there is this liquid hole in the brain, the volume after 65 dramatically increase, and that correlates with the white meter. This is in here, ironically dark. Uh, white meter volume decrease. And white meter is actually the 
uh, white matter is the where the neurons mostly, which is contradictory because we look to the gray matter where we see the soma, but volumetrically thinking, a neuron is 95% to 98% AX, uh, volume is in axon, and these axons are packed in the white matter. So we thought, why this is white matter is decreasing and we couldn't find a uh, molecular explanation. So we thought, who would know better than the, uh, the cells that surveying the brain, microglia? Uh, these cells are micro, but the name only comes from because their soma is tiny. Uh, actually, they do a lot of uh, work in the brain and any kind of pathology or stress, they respond. They are the first responders. So if we can understand their responses, we could maybe understand what is going on. So for that, what um, my group, uh, we established with Mika Simons is, we dissected the mice uh, uh, white matter versus gray matter cortical regions and uh, established a single cell transcriptomic either by SmartSeq or 10X platforms. And then we can actually compare what's differently happening in the white matter. It's a early spatial transcriptomics if you want. Um, and that protocol, and we have optimized that protocol and the publications down in here. And Simon uh, is a first PhD student, just done a, a small set of uh, smart sick experiments. And we were really surprised that we saw a activated microglial signature only in the white meter of H animals. And when we looked at the gene expression signature, when Simon checked that, what he saw is a homeostatic microglia, which uh, genes of the homeostatic microglia was lost in this one, and it was upregulating phagocytosis and antigen representation genes in the set one. That's really cool, but it is not so much cells. Still, we, we sequence them quite deep, so we know uh, really nicely characterized, but we wanted to see if the numbers would change anything. So we repeat the experiment, but this time using 10x, and we uh, 24 months old, uh, uh, mice, we isolate the white matter and capture the microglia. And as you see here, we see the same four clusters, nearly identical gene expression signature, identify the VAM. And again, we see the VAM only in white matter. And that was uh, quite nice validation. We wanted to further go on and move to the previous studies also used the uh, aging, which is Hammond et al. and Piriguero, uh, Beth Stevens and Bart Stupers lab, they had aging. They study disease conditions, so compared to the Alzheimer disease or uh, MS lesions, this is a milder activation, but they also have the identical gene expression signature. And since they have longitudinal one, we saw a age dependent increase in their data that white matter uh, associated microglias are the key change in the brain, uh, mouse brain aging. So we go on and we uh, use the RNA in situ with uh, immunohistochemistry combined and we show all the markers we identified actually shows, as you see here, the gray matter of the mouse and the white matter corpus callosum. All microglia activation happened in the white matter and that happened in a very age-dependent manner. Until 18, it was quite flat and then they are increased, which resembled, which we really uh, was uh, happy about it because it resembled the human uh, white meter aging after 65 accelerating. So we looked at the ER electron microscopy and we saw this guy, microglia makes like a five, six cells uh, clumped together and they are filled with myelin debris here you see inside. And we can do show that also in the electron microscope uh, with the fluorescent microscopy. Here you see the myelin labeled and they are in these microglia clumps. And we see these four to six microglia clump together and digesting myelin. So, uh, it's kind of what is the uh, function of that uh, 
white matter associated microglia, what is the consequence? And for that, we go a, look to a molecule called TRAM2. TRAM2 is a really uh, high interest. We, there are a bunch of clinical trials going on for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So when you have a mutation in the TRAM2 gene, a single allele, if it is reduced the function, uh, you have higher risk of Alzheimer's, actually very early stage Alzheimer's disease. If you lose both of them and you caught Nasohakola disease, which is a <clears throat> which is a disease that mainly affects the white meter, and you see the brain's white meter regions are quite uh, degenerated. So we thought, does it, since TRAM2 is mostly expressed in the microglia, we looked to the TRAM2 knockout, and what we saw was, ooh, uh, TRAM2 could not induce to this white meter associated microglia. And what is the consequence of that? We looked there and we saw this myelin walls. Uh, Marti uh, Martina has showed this, and what we saw here is myelin debris that are normal myelin looks like that. This is your axon, and it wraps around really nicely the myelin sheet around it so that its electricity can go isolation of the uh, neuronal connectivity. And here with the TRAM2, we see myelin uh, without the exons lying around, and this mice happens in the aging, and that suggests that uh, that suggests that uh, that suggests that uh, sorry, somebody come in. Uh, that suggests the white matter associated microglia is a protective response. So we are uh, part of this consortium trying to uh, make a roadmap for the microglia responses. And in this uh, roadmap uh, paper, we, uh, we summarize that importance of the disease responses of microglia. And uh, this is a very important clinical intervention point for the neurodegenerative diseases. And in the home, normal aging, we saw the VAM response, and we think this VAM response is a pre-installed program that is overactivated and combined with other activation uh, signals in the uh, disease conditions. We are quite happy about this finding, but honestly, we didn't answer what we asked. And what we wanted to ask is why there's a H induced myelin pathology, and we thought microglia can tell us. What we learn is microglia is postponing this H induced myelin pathology by cleaning the myelin debris. But induces pathology, we didn't know. So since we have this uh, differential uh, dissection method, uh, Nico Tuberk and Laura, Laura and Tuberk in my lab, teamed up with again with Mika Simon's group. And we this time looked to the uh, oligodendrocytes between gray and white matter and how these signatures change. And we again use both Tanex and SmartSec. And we saw oligo one and oligo two, these are well characterized signature, a very large blue cluster, we call it H-related oligodendrocyte and a small, tiny interferon response oligos. So here you see that H-related oligodendrocyte, we show it in SmartSec, that's only occurs, comes from the aged white meter. And we have this quite tiny 3% start one positive oligodendrocytes. It's a small population, but it had a, such a discrete gene expression, we got interested about it, and we wanted to thought what type of uh, interferon signal that could be. One second. So many construction going on here. So we asked the question, uh, this interferon oligos, could it be DNA damage, type 1 interferon, or uh, CD8 T cells, adaptive immune systems could be allowed. So the, the, in the brain, you don't see adaptive immune CD8 T cells very often. They are quite rare. Uh, interferon response oligos are quite rare. 
And then if they are not close, we can actually rule that CD8 is easily without. And uh, Laura checked the, their location. And we were quite small surprised that every way we check, we find the interferon response oligos and CD8 T cells localized together. You know, this is correlation, not causation. So uh, next we look to the checkpoint inhibitors. These are cancer drugs that really unleash the T cells might onto the their targets in cancer is cancer cells. But we saw that this cancer cells, six weeks of treatment in 18 months, it's really uh, 10 times increased the interferon response oligo numbers. So we saw uh, some kind of casual relationship. But again, we wanted to nail that in a uh, opposite way. And what we done this time is we use the RAC knockout. RAC1 is a key molecule for leukocyte development. And if you knock it out, this mouse has immune deficiency because they don't have functional B and T cells. And we got a really nice single cell data set, nearly uh, 45,000 cells, and all the major cell types were there. And when we looked at the T cells cluster from there, we saw that Ragnacot has very few T cells and they are probably uh, non-functional. The, they are, they were immature. And Next, we look to the oligodendrocytes. And as you see, they blend quite good. The data sets are matching nicely. And when we use the SC coder from Fabian's lab, we saw that wild type white meter, H white meter, has significantly high uh, interferon response oligos than any other uh, in the rock knockout white meter. So, suggesting another way, it was showing that. This is, and this response is interferon response is CD8 dependent. So oligos are not the only cells that does the interferon response or uh, res uh, responses. So we next focus to microglia. Now we have much more cells, so we can actually capture this small interferon uh, response. We see the homeo1, homeo2, and white matter associated microglia. And this in the heart of that, the black is interferon response that are marked clearly by this set of interferon response genes. And when we looked there, we saw not as dramatic, but quite CD8 dependency in the uh, microglial interferon response, that, uh, response as well. And if you look to the white meter, that is also localized in the white meter. So that's Really cool. We go on and uh, confirm these findings, showing that interferon response microglia, IBO1 and STAT1 positive microglia, uh, happens H dependently. Uh -oh, there you go. Uh, H dependently. And uh, this H dependent increase is significantly decreased in the RAC knockout. So that's quite cool. So we are talking about this interferon response oligos and what they are doing uh, and they are existing, but actually we haven't told you that what they are doing, right? So the, the function what we wanted to understand is uh, how the white meter uh, volume decreases. So in order to see that in mouse, we uh, counted the oligodendrocyte density in white and the gray meter through ages. And what we see uh, here is in the gray meter, 12, 18 months, and 12, 24 months, oligodendrocyte density did not change. We saw a sig uh, significant age-dependent decrease in the white meter oligodendrocyte density. And to our delight, Ragnacot rescued this function, uh, this decrease. So this is really exciting because if it is true, we are linking to interferon response, this small population actually leading to uh, white meter uh, loss. You might say it's not CD8 dependent because Ragnacot also uh, knocks out all T cells and the B cells. So to ad address that, we got a CD8 knockout mouse and aged uh, more than two years. 
and show that the old key findings were reproduced within this key, uh, CDH specific H knockout as well. We have uh, the loss of white matter oligodendrocytes were decreased, uh, rescued. So in the beginning, we set the question why the white matter, why the dementia increased and the, our main correlation was the uh, loss of the white matter volume. And now we are seeing that this loss is driven by CD8 T cells uh, in mice. And what is the mechanism? It's a tough question. <laughs> it's going to take quite a while. We done some crude experiments. So interferon gamma is uh, T cells uh, secrete, CD8 T cells secrete interferon gamma. And we wonder if interferon gamma alone without the T cells can lead to uh, white matter lesions. We actually got a really surprising result there because we injected onto a young and old mouse. And when we looked to the old mouse, it was horrible. So you see a huge hole and lesion. In young animals, we didn't see anything really dramatic that didn't induce the same injection into the white matter, did not induce any major effect. So that was really surprising because suggests that brain aging primes the uh, uh, interferon gamma response. We further wanted to thought that if the H oligodendrocyte gets, uh, if the oligodendrocytes are interferon gamma sensitive, we make a primary culture to, uh, with Mikasimon's Espachbish protocols and we treat them with different concentration of interferon gamma and they are like, it's Monday for them, they don't care. Uh, the, there was no cell loss. However, if we just spike in a little bit microglia, it gets quite carnage. In 48 hours, the only oligodendrocyte we see here is, you see the IBO1 cells, they live together happily. But if you add the interferon gamma, the only oligo you see is actually being digested by microglia. So, in summary, what we proposing here is quite a uh, brave uh, assumption that aging age-related oligodendrocytes start to shed myelin because it's one of the longest living after the uh, histones. This is the longest living molecule in the brain. And <clears throat> this molecule is cleared by the microglia, which also present this to the CD8 T cells, which might increase the colonial expansion of CD8 T cells, leading to cascade of white matter loss and increasing the dementia risk. This took quite a while, uh, single cell, a confocal electron microscopy, another single cell, and the progress is really slow to really target the diseases. And how we can make this progress faster? So we look to the uh, famous, famous talk. There is plenty of room at the bottom. This is the talk that uh, kicked off the nanotechnology. And he, in the talk, middle, middle of the talk, he talks about biology and he gives the biologist advice. If you want to make more rapid progress, just make the electron microscope 100 times better. So Peter, took this advice and he was asking what would make the electron microscope 100 times better. So when we look to the electron microscopy images, we don't really understand anything because we see beautiful structures, but which cell, what is that structure? It's a vast amount of knowledge without any labels. We thought we could, if we can bring the labels onto the, the structures, that images could tell us a lot. So, and the, the recent development of the MERFISH, we thought if we can combine these two technologies, that would be really cool. So Peter uh, and Catherine in the lab established uh, a MERFISH and uh, with the MERFISH, we it's a uh, well established spatial transcriptomic single molecule method. We first hybridized the encoding probes, target probes up to thousand genes. And then in a, different uh, multiple hybridization uh, runs, 
we got a binary code 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So we know this spot is which transcript based on this code. And since this is established, we thought it would be really cool if we just cut two sections adjacent nearby and get one Murphish, one EM. And later, maybe we can align the cell identities. And in order to make things a little bit more fun, we use a brain demyelinating lesion so that in one side we had a damage of the brain. This works really good, uh, Murphish, and Murphish give us the, all the major cell types. And here you see the three brains. In the left side, you see the lesions. And we can identify, the, here we use 300 something probes and we can identify all the major cell types. And you see here red microglia accumulate the lesion site and it became quite red. And since microglia is accumulated there, we decide to focus the microglia. So we see a four major microglial clusters in here, homoesthetic large cluster, interferon again localized in the middle, disease associated microglia it omits identified. And on the edge of that, we saw a lamps, uh, lipid associated because in addition to the dam markers, they were really I upregulated the pillin to GPNB uh, and all the cholesterol transporters. And we could see that lipid cluster also was enriched in the injection site. So we could look to the lesion sites here, the cell identities, all the microglia prod. And when we look to the core of the lesion, we saw that it, they were enriched in that lesion. So we wanted to make sure our transcriptomic Murphish is not biased by the limited number of genes. So we do a adjacent SmartSec2 experiment, sorted the microglia from these mice and cluster them, and then compare to Murphish markers with the single cell SmartSec uh, clusters. So we saw the same four clusters in this um, SmartSec2, and to our delight, it's actually matches great. But this is, you know, uh, and this is not many labs are running right now. Murphish, what we wanted to do, bring the morphology because Murphish uses protease K, there is no cellular morphology that you only got the, the transcriptomic information. For that, we uh, cut the adjacent section and Martina used these uh, adjacent sections for serial uh, microtomy and used the uh, serial imaging with the electron microscope and done the uh, image analysis. And here you see the overlay of the underlying EM image uh, with a low resolution and adjacent section of the uh, Murphish cell identity is overlaid. We changed the protocol for matching two protocols and to our surprise, it worked both good. Uh, both EM and the Murphish give us a really nice uh, results. And uh, Martina afterwards went through and go to the identify every cell in the lesion based on their morphology. So I wanted to highlight here foamy microglia. Here you see these white dots. These are the lipid droplets and we they are well characterized for me. And we couldn't identify a, one immune cell type. Maybe we thought it was a, a migrating immune cell type with a unique uh, nuclear morphology and we call them uh, unknown. But since we have the adjacent section, look, we could just merge this transcriptomic and morphological identities and link those. So the first one was foamy microglia versus the lipid associated microglia. And as you can see, they are localized in the same locations. And now we know this the cholesterol related genes are very logically are enriched in the cells that are filled with the lipid droplets. So that was quite pleasant. And then we have this unknown immune cell. And since we have a lot of 
markers for adaptive immune cells we saw in the murfish there are no dendritic cells or some weird cell coming in but they localize in the same regions of the interferon response microglia since interferon response microglia is a small population they were not well characterized in the em uh, morphologies so we thought these could be the unknown cells and to our surprise and actually with the same time that was coming with our T cell story, we saw the T cells just in the center of this uh, interferon response microglia, suggesting T cell activates and the effector cells of the T cell signaling is this interferon response microglia. We could do um, that computationally. Well, yeah. We have five more minutes. I'm actually done nearly. Uh, <clears throat> so the we done the cell neighborhood analysis and we show that computationally and we hope that electron microscopy, we could actually uh, spatial transcriptomic jump between those and we can train some algorithms to predict the structure from cell identity. Just wanted to touch briefly, we have a fantastic collaboration with Martin Guerra. So they do spatial lipidomics with MALDI imaging and we can actually combine lipidomic signatures of the cells to their transcriptomic imaging. So what I wanted to say is the last point, there is plenty of room in the spatial biology that we can actually jump between transcriptomic to ultrastructure to the metabolics, lipidomics, and that opens up vast amount of opportunities for us. So that's the... That's my main message actually in here. Using the technologies, we can accelerate this uh, biological translation to the clinic. And I think spatial transcriptomics combined with single cell opens up a uh, huge opportunities for us. So thank you. And hopefully I didn't talk too much. No, that's perfect timing. Thank you for this fantastic talk, very exciting. Now is the time for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand here in the chat or uh, drop it on the chat actually here. Yeah. Um, let's see. Maybe I can start with one and then you can. Uh, sure. Okay. So this, this was very exciting. And I was wondering, I, I'm not in the neurobiology field, but I was wondering if you have explored this method uh, Using this method and the interaction between uh, these T cells and vasculature cells like parasites. As far as I understand, they have a role in uh, in in dimension as well. So the parasites are quite uh, plastic cells actually, and yeah. the mural cells, and their identities from smooth muscle. I mean, a vascular uh, institute. But one challenge we had is they've been very challenging to isolate for single cell. And uh, here I was also the one of the ch you're pointing one of the challenges we have in the spatial is the segmentation. Yeah. Uh, Johanna Kluckhammer in Munich she is doing exceptional work there. Uh, we still need the single cell data to make sure uh, spatial transcriptomic segmentation is not due to the uh, cross readings because in a 15 micrometer we have many cells overlaying in that segmented area, and Parasites and endothelial cells are one of the challenging cells to get to the single cell for us. Uh, and but yeah, we haven't done that, but we have uh, we have the data, and we would be really uh, this is one of the main interests trying to move to the vascular effect of uh, the dementias. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that there are the vascular damage plus the aging effects are the first triggers. So that's that's the uh, really important intervention point. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, people um, still no question, but I have, if you don't mind, another follow up question. Uh, I mean, this is brain and uh, it's very cool, but how, what do you think, uh, how is it gonna be to translate this to our tissues? So the actual brain is the tricky tissue, right? Because uh, we have so many cell types and they are overlaying to each other. Uh, and the more, the basic, the spatial transcriptomics wise, 
segmentation is the hardest in the brain. And uh, what I do see training of the uh, basic understanding which cell and transcriptional factor with the morphology most challenging in the brain tissue. In the other tissues where the cells are much better structured and the structures are better, pathologies will realize, I would expect, and pathology makes the structural changes much more clearer. And if we can actually combine the electron microscopy and spatial transcriptomic in other tissues and uh, link these transcriptional identities, hope would be there would be enough machine learning uh, training data set for a deep learning that we can one day look to the EM image and a machine learning algorithm, a deep learning algorithm can point, oh, this is that transcriptional identity of a cell. And that suggests these, these pathways are dysregulated. And mm. uh, so the, this is the hope that uh, combining multiple, uh, for each tissue, we need to have a large data sets of these and train algorithms. But I think, uh, non-neuronal tissue would be much easier. Thank you. We have a question from the <clears> audience. <throat> like, can you elaborate on myelin damage theory, which you mentioned during the talk? So, well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's not a theory, actually. It is more, uh, we know that multiple sclerosis and uh, multiple sclerosis generally induced by my myelin associated uh, MOC induces uh, many of the MS features. And myelin is a very effective uh, autoantigen. So that's why we have white matter specific MS cases. And the second point is uh, when you look to the half-life of the pro uh, structures in the brain, histones are the longest living proteins and the myelin proteins are next second. And their half-life increase um, uh, increase during aging. That uh, when we are age, myelin became uh, accumulates a lot of uh, post-transcriptional damage, oxidation, uh, ubiquitination, a lot of post modifications. And we think that these damage and not being able to this. You saw this. We need electron microscopy to study myelin because they are really tight. Uh, to this aging myelin is not stable and we're losing this myelin, uh, myelin goes down and microglia needs to clear it. And the two genes we see is the lysosomal phagocytotic genes and uh, antigen representation. So I think once while they are clearing it as a uh, phagocytotic macrophage, they also call for help for adaptive immune system. And I think in the short term, it helps, but after a few years of this constant clearing, they call T cells to help, and that's not helping. So we need to decouple the clearing of the myelin from the adaptive immune system activation. Uh, at least in mouse, we can do that. And in human, that's in the patients, if that would be the same case that we need to see. And that's, that's the exciting part I'm, right now. I'm really excited that translation. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, how does it Merfish produce? Uh, sorry, how does it Merfish study works? Uh, affect <clears throat> tissue quality for electron microscopy? Oh yeah, that's... Uh, we are so lucky because Martina uh, Sheffer, she's amazing. And uh, we made some modifications uh, on the EM protocol, but she knew where we could uh, modify. Uh, we were really scared for Murfish won't come because Murfish, when we used Murfish, it was only uh, used on the fresh frozen. And our sections are... Uh, PFA fixed, perfused, uh, and then uh, overnight, uh, overnight PFA embed, uh, PFA post fix, and later cross embedded another day. And I was scared like there will be no RNA left uh, at the end. However, we have little less detection. Uh, 
but not really significant even. And the R square of the fresh, uh, fresh frozen murfish and the EM protocol, the SDGM protocol, um, murfish was quite mentioned. Uh, it's, it's, we got the same information. So the EM, we didn't compromise for the EM protocol too much. We shortened some of the incubations, but we stick to the EM procedure as much as we can. And Murphish kind of forgave us and gave us a good quality data. But uh, that's a really one of the main challenges and this project's bottleneck was there. We realized EM is not forgiving. <laughs> uh, the protocol of the EM and we got okay sections. Okay, thank you. And there is a last question. Uh, what is the function of TREM2 microglia in aging in relation to CA uh, positive uh, interferon uh, gamma cells? Um, that's actually, yeah. I'm trying to hire people to address this question. <laughs> uh, so the TREM2 generally a macrophage activation and uh, in the brain, it's mostly taught to the microglial function related. And Microphages and uh, adaptive T cells communicate closely, and I think, uh, not I think, T and tram without tram microphage activation doesn't happen. So we are blocking the macrophage communication to the T cells, which is prerequisite of the T cell activation in any uh, host tissue. So tram is required at least on the textbook uh, of the macrophage, but how that would be affecting in the peripheral and the priming of the T-cells. It opens up the gut-brain uh, axis. It opens all these different, and we see the similar cases with the COVID. Uh, long COVID also associated with T-cells migrating to the white matter and increasing the white matter hypertensis. Uh, so we think interferon gamma uh, and and also the uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> the practically uh, all these infections related to T cell activation and going to the brain and seems to be white meter is the first target. Why white meter is the first target? That's an open question as well, but it's not so surprising given the uh, multiple sclerosis and other diseases, uh, adaptive immune system has some kind of tendency to go there. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, thank you very much. If you have more questions for uh, Austin, please uh, send him an, a message. And if you're interested in joining his lab, he also shared that information as well. So thank you Austin for this fantastic talk, that's very nice. And uh, that was my pleasure, thank you. Yeah, and thank you everyone for joining us all. Have a nice day and enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye.